The epistle for today's Sunday, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Brethren, see that you walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, do not become unwise, but understanding what is the will of God. Do not be drunk with wine, wherein is luxury. Be you filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual canticles, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God and the Father, being subject one to another in the fear of Christ. Please stand for the gospel. The gospel is taken from the fourth chapter of the gospel of St. John. At that time, there was a certain ruler whose son was sick at Capernaum. He, having heard that Jesus was come from Judea into Galilee, went to him and prayed him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus therefore said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you do not believe. The ruler says to him, Lord, come down before my son dies. Jesus says to him, Go thy way, thy son lives. The man believed the word which Jesus said to him and went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him, and they brought word, saying that his son lived. He asked therefore of them the hour wherein he grew better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father therefore knew that it was at the same hour that Jesus said to him, Thy son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, it is a good and holy thing to get married. So many times in the past year I've spoken to you about the religious vocation and the priestly vocation, and how, many, how we need to have young people offering themselves for the religious life or the priesthood. But realistically, I know as a priest that those who end up pursuing a vocation will be statistically fewer, and that in the end, the majority of our young people are called to the married state. And that's the reason why I want, in today's sermon, to encourage our young people to get married and also help their parents prepare their children for marriage, for the sacrament of holy matrimony. Because marriage is a holy thing. It is of God. You know that God designed the human race, and one of the choices he made in designing the human race was that it would be two genders, male and female, and that they would be complementary. And that the only way that human beings can bring other human beings into this world, the only way we get new life, is through an intimate union of a man and a woman. He made it, he wanted to make it such that every single one of us, every single human being, has a father and a mother. And he wanted to make it such that we are psychologically dependent upon our father and our mother. We need, as children, for our father and our mother to have a lifelong commitment to one another for us to be able to develop properly. As such, we can, we can certainly claim that um, God's design of the human race has marriage as an essential part of, of our humanity. Um, God, we may say, instituted marriage at the same time that he created the human race. It's an essential part of God's plans for us. As a result, we must revere and honor marriage. We must foster and protect marriage. And young people should want to start a family for that reason. They should have this desire to form their own families. They should be convinced that by doing so, by forming a family, they are following a plan that has been established by God for the human race. But besides this, besides the fact that they would recognize that, okay, this is, this is a state in life that has been made by God for, for human beings, they should also have a desire to build up the kingdom of God. The society around us needs Catholic families, good husbands and wives who are God-fearing and who bring up their children with the respect 
for what God has established. Even if we look to the heavenly society, those who are dwelling in heaven right now, that society also needs Catholic families. God, when, when he sanctions marriage, when he blesses marriage, he does not just ask a father and a mother to contribute to the building up of human society, earthly society. He also asks father and mother to bring children into the world so they can populate heaven. They are meant to sanctify their children. They are meant to give their, their children an example of holiness such that their children save their souls and that there will be certain souls in heaven enjoying happiness forever because of the, the mother and the father have done their job as parents. This is the most glorious thing that God calls parents to accomplish. So, and I just want to be very straightforward with you and, and confess frankly that I, I don't think that we have as many marriages here at St. Isidore's as, as we should. And this is something that concerns me. I've obviously only been here a year, but I'm able to, to, to look at the register. I have to fill out the register periodically. I'm able to look at the history of, of this parish and, and how many marriages take place. And, and when, I, when I look at the register, I, there are a couple of things I notice. One of the things I notice is that there are not as many marriages as there should be. Um, if, we, if I look especially in the past years, marriages you would expect as a parish grows, they would be increasing, but they're not increasing. Um, they're, they're perhaps decreasing or at least staying the same. The second thing that I notice is that marriages between our own faithful, our own parishioners, are quite rare. It's much more often that, that you have one of our own faithful, one of our own congregation members, marries someone from outside the parish. And as a result, I mean, we just, truth be told, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just being very frank, we, we have very few young couples in our parish. We're very much a middle-aged parish. And so all the more do, do we need there to be uh, more marriages, and especially those good and holy marriages between our own faithful uh, so that we can sustain our own community. And I want to encourage such marriages in this sermon today. But I really don't feel like I'm in the best position to do so, to be honest, because of the fact that I've spent 10 out of the 14 years of my priesthood teaching in a seminary. And there's not a big focus on marriage in seminary, obviously. There's a big focus on keeping young men away from marriage and, and, and on the path to the priesthood. So what I did was um, I called up one of the senior priests of the Society of St. Pius X, who's known to be a sort of an expert in this area, in order to kind of get his advice and his counsel on this delicate topic. And I want to pass on to you today some of his insights and also some thoughts of my own on perhaps some things that would make for success or failure in our young people pursuing the married state. And these thoughts are primarily for parents. I will also speak to, to the young people, the youth, um, but they're primarily for parents because of the fact that the parents have the biggest impact on their children, on whether their children will pursue the married state. So one of the things that, that I mentioned to, to Father well, let's just call him Father Smith. I won't give his name. Well, let's just call him Father Smith. So one of the things that I, that I mentioned to, to Father Smith is that, that something I've noticed in the parishes I've observed is that children of some families seem to have a knack for getting married, while children of other families seem, it seems very difficult for them to, to get married. If you have a family of, of six or eight or ten children, and some of these families, they just they all seem to have no problem getting married and forming a family of their own. Whereas if you have a, another family of, of like size, it seems like the children kind of flounder once they reach adulthood and either uh, they don't get married or um, they get married later in life in their 30s or their 40s. So Father S Smith, he, he mentioned three things that, that might make for success or failure on the side of the parents for preparing their children to have this knack, this knack of getting married, this knack of finding someone with whom they're able to build a lifelong relationship. 
I think these three points are crucial because of the fact that we observe that, that I think it is uh, a reality that some parents do a better job at this than others. So the first thing is that a married couple needs to be happy in their marriage if they are to expect their children will be confident in forming a family of their own. So if the children are happy at home, they see that the parents love one another, they support one another, then the children will say, I want to do the same thing. My family is, is a very happy place. Um, it's, it's a very loving home that I have. And my dream is to replicate that. My dream is to do something equivalent of what my, my family has done, my parents have done. Whereas if the family is, is very unhappy, um, if they have sort of um, an unpleasant experience when they are growing up, they are likely to say, I don't know if I, if I want to do this myself. My own family life has, not, has been so unpleasant, I don't know that I want to uh, establish my own family. So children that have a happy family life growing up are often more confident about their own ability to marry and are more capable of establishing a stable family. The second point is that it's so important for the parents to make their children responsible adults and to hold their children accountable as they're growing up for adult-sized responsibilities. Too often the common parenting style today uh, in which we, we say is, is a factor in producing a generation of, uh, that's been called millennials, um, or they're, they're not known for, for the highest level of commitment or ability to take on responsibility. Um, this common parenting style is where the parents just do everything for their children. And then when their children grow up, they're just not ready to take on any life-size responsibilities. They're immature, they don't know how to handle money, they don't know how to do laundry, they don't know how to cook, you know, they don't know what goes into purchasing a car, or just so many things that, that adults do on a regular basis. And as such, they're just not in a position um, to commit themselves to anything major. And, and of course, getting married is, is a very, very big thing. Um, so the, the children are not ready for that, they're adults, in, in body, but they have not reached maturity, and it's going to take a lot longer before they attain that maturity if their parents have not communicated to them life skills. They haven't been looking to give to their children life skills. Instead, they've just been doing everything for their kids. The third thing, and I think really this is the most important of them all, is that it's so important for parents to have a personal relationship with their children. This may seem obvious, but it's, it's in fact not. What can tend to happen sometimes is that parents give orders to their children, they give commands to their children, they, they want to enforce a certain behavior in their children. They tell, tell their children, you need to do this, you need to do that, and, and they expect their children to obey, but they never take the time to actually sit down with their, their children, especially their adolescents, and talk to them in a mature adult way about life-size questions. And as a result, the, the, the adolescents uh, don't really have any idea of what an adult relationship is like. Um, when, when their parents speak to them about mature topics and converse with them openly about the big questions uh, of life, it's like in that alone, that's their first experience of an adult relationship. Hopefully one of the things that's taking place in, in good marriages is that the, the couple is, are, are very communicative, that they're always speaking about the big questions, that there's, there's nothing that they don't talk about with one another. Well, children get an idea of that if their parents are already very open with them and they're conversing with their children, with their adolescents, as I say, you don't do this with a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, but they're, they're, they're conversing with their adolescents about big questions and they're very open with them and they're, and they're wanting to communicate their wisdom to their children. And it's not just do this, do that, but the children, they have no idea the reason why they're being commanded to do these things. And then when they come uh, in face, face-to-face -face with some major life questions, 
they're not at all inclined to talk to their parents. They feel like the topic perhaps is, ta is taboo, um, or they just have no experience of interacting with their parents at that level. Whereas if the parents have been very open to them, whenever the, the, the adolescent or, or you know, the young adult comes across some difficulties, it's very natural for them to speak to their parents. I think it's here that we especially see that, that parenting is an art. It's an art because the parents must adapt their parenting to the age of the children. They must gradually um, adapt to the, the growing maturity of their child. And they wouldn't have the, the same parenting style for a five-year-old or for a 10-year-old or for a 15-year-old. But they would, they would continually be seeing what their child needs at their current stage of development, and they would provide that to their children. So those are the three main things, according to, to Father Smith, that parents should do in order to adequately prepare their children for adult life and for taking on a lifelong commitment with someone else in forming a happy marriage and a happy family. To be happy in their own marriage and loving towards one another, that they hold their children responsible uh, and make them accountable for, for the things they do, give them life skills, and that they have this very communicative relationship with their adolescents. But let me also remark briefly that besides the fact that the children of some families are quite successful in marriage while the children of others are not, another phenomenon you might notice is that in some families, all the boys are able to get married, but the girls are not. Or the girls are able to, to get married, but the boys are not. And again, there are many reasons, there are many possible reasons we could ascribe to, to this, this phenomenon. Um, and this is a massive topic, and there's no way I can say this and everything in a reasonable time. But there, there are perhaps one reason why uh, you would have a situation where the, the boys were getting married and the girls were not, is that the parents are perhaps too protective for their girls. Um, parents tend to be a, a bit more judicious in advising their girls about who they should marry and who they should not marry. And there's some parents who, when, when a young man starts to show a little interest in their daughter, they pull their daughter back. And even if, if the young man is a, is a good Catholic, um, he's, he, he might have some quirks or what have you, um, but they are too ready to, to pull their, their daughter back and she ends up becoming a Spencer. If, if the girls are getting married but not the boys, it might be because of the bad example that they're receiving from their father. Boys uh, are generally less interested in, in marriage than, than girls. It takes more for, for a young man to be interested in marriage than, than a young woman. And if the boy observes in his father um, an excessive love for pleasure, um, a, a laziness, uh, where the, the father doesn't really help out around the home, and he's projecting to his son that the ideal in life is basically to do as little as possible, then the son is not going to be inspired to take on life-size responsibilities. He's not going to be inclined to pursue excellence, um, to choose a state in life this, where he's, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice that's required. So if the, if the father is not projecting his own self-sacrifice, if he doesn't give an example of self-sacrifice, then the young man will not be inspired himself to be self-sacrificing and choose the married state. Now, I'm not saying any of these things with, with this family or that family in mind or, or even the specific people here. I, it, this is just all speaking in generalities, this is just a conversation, as I said, I have with Father Smith. He was talking about things that he's observed in his priesthood. I'm only wanting to provide some insight to parents on how they might prepare their children for successful marriages in the future. And as I say, there's much, much more that could be said on the topic, um, but I hope that at least there's there a few ideas that might be of assistance. Meanwhile, for the youth, I want to encourage the young people, first of all, as I've said, to have this desire to enter into the state of marriage, 
uh, recognizing that it is a very good thing, that it is f of God, that it is holy. Um, and you must desire to, to do, the, to accomplish the plan that God has for you in this life. And for a lot of you, that means getting married. Secondly, I want to encourage you to believe that you do have what it takes to form a lifelong relationship with someone of the opposite sex, regardless of whatever difficulties might have existed in your own family life. I think we can all, as adults, we can all look back at the way we were raised and we can say, well, you know, this, this thing over here, this aspect of my parents was very good. I really appreciate them for that. But this, this other thing that was going on in my family was, was not so healthy. Um, but regardless, what, what we are meant to do when we become adults is to assess the good and the bad and then um, form an idea in our, in our minds of the family that, that we would like to have, that, that we would like to form, where we obviously exclude the bad, we do something different from our parents um, in what they did wrongly, and then keeping the good, whatever they did that, that was good, we, we want to maintain that. But you must be convinced that it's within your power to plan your family. Um, even before you, you meet the person that you will marry, you can already be thinking about your dream family, the family that, that you would like to have. One of the things that, that Father Smith lamented in his observations is that so many of these couples, they spend much more time on their wedding, planning their wedding, than they do planning their marriage. They spend all this time planning the, the very day on which they're going to get married, but they're not really thinking so much about their whole life that they're, that they're going to spend with one another. They're not, they're not reflecting on the best way to design their family. They're just more thinking about the wedding dress and the bridesmaids and the, and the groomsmen and, and all, the, all those things. That's why Father Smith says he recommends to, to young people that they, they form three lists that they take the effort to reflect, they make one list where they put down all the qualities that they would like to see in their future spouse. And again, this can be before they've even met anybody. They, they just think about those qualities, and, and they, he emphasizes you that they must not edit themselves. It's whatever comes to mind. If they want someone who likes cats, well, they, they put that down, you know. If they want someone who, who hates fast food, well, they, they put that down. Whatever, whatever comes to mind, they, they write it down. Then they form a second list that's just the reverse of the first list, things that they definitely don't want in a future spouse. And, and again, it's just whatever. Whatever comes to mind, don't, don't edit yourself. Um, if you don't like snoring, put it down. You know, if you don't like people with nasal voices, put it down. Whatever comes to your mind, you just, you just write it down on this list. And then that, that may, you know, take whatever time it, it, it takes. It may, be, it may be a month. It may be a, a couple months to, to form this list and really to reflect upon it thoroughly, sort of a reflection upon yourself and your own inclinations, your, your likes and dislikes. Then you go through and you put a star by the deal breakers, by the things where you say this is absolutely necessary for the person to have these qualities. Um, for, I mean, and I would hope that, that you would put a star by the fact that they need to be a, a Catholic. Um, or, you know, a, a girl would, would hopefully put a, a star by the fact that he has to have a stable job or he's not addicted to pornography or, or something like that. But, but if it's like, well, I, he, I, I can't have him, <laughs> I, I can't date a man who snores, that would probably be unreasonable. That, that should not be one of the, the deal breakers that, that she would hopefully be able to get used to that over time. So finally, after forming, after you form a clear idea of the person that, that you would like to marry, then you form a third list, and this is perhaps the most important of them all, you form a list of the qualities that you have to have in order to attract such a person. What kind of person do I need to be such that I could reasonably expect that someone who fits this description would want to marry me? What are those qualities? How can I foster them? What kind of person do I need to be? 
So my dear faithful, this question of marriage is, is a very important one. Um, we definitely need to pray to God each day for many holy Catholic families. Parents should have in mind that uh, a big part of, of their job in raising their children is to prepare them to form a Catholic family. They should do this by, first of all, having a happy home and having a loving relationship with one another. They should set a good example for their children. They should teach their children responsibility, and they should speak to their children about the important topics of life, form their, their ideas um, about how they can prudentially go about choosing a good spouse. Meanwhile, the youth must have a desire to make their contribution to society by forming those good and Catholic families. They should have the ambition to form a good and holy family. They must be inspired by the fact that our Lord raised marriage to the level of a sacrament and that every Catholic marriage, um, the union of the couples, is meant to be a symbol of the union between Christ and his church. This is meant to be their ideal, to replicate in the qualities of their marriage the same things that go on in the relationship between our Lord Jesus Christ and his church. It is true that, that our times are a bit unstable, they're a bit uncertain, but we must not let that keep us from, from planning our future and from wanting to establish roots. Um, we have to trust in God that, that everything will work out for, for the best if we seek to do his will in our lives. So let us especially pray to our Lord um, that prayer that we, that we add, not, not just to, to pray for, for priestly vocations, for, for many priests, for many monks, for, for many nuns to, to be added to the church, but let us also include that prayer that we always say, Dear Lord, please grant us many holy Catholic families. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.